3, 2, 1, let's get this party started! Welcome back everybody, I'm Simon Severino, your host, and today we dive deep with the founder and CEO of Social Engineering LLC, who is also adjunct professor of social engineering for an NSA Cyber School of Excellence at the University of Arizona, and also author of Human Hacking, Win Friends, Influence People and Leave Them Better Off for Having Met You. We will talk about how we can make friends, how to leave others better off, and how to recognize scams. Welcome, everybody, Christopher Hadnagi. Hey, Simon, thanks for having me. So cool to have you here. And what are you currently creating, Christopher? Well, I'm actually excited about this. Um, I'm about to launch um, two new initiatives. First is the uh, Institute for Social Engineering, which is going to be a performance-based school to help people get into the cybersecurity industry fast. And uh, in March, we're about to launch our first ever human behavior conference, which is going to be to, uh, a three-day conference filled with social psychologists and scientists and researchers talking about how we can use communication skills and human behavior to better our lives. Wow. And you come from helping people who are getting scammed for some reason and you reverse engineer, hey, I can use all these techniques for good. Yeah. I, uh, I started in this uh, maybe about 15, 16 years ago, just studying the sciences behind influence and persuasion and realizing that this is the same thing scammers are doing. That We're seeing this every day. Malicious hackers are using these same principles to get us to do things we shouldn't do. But then I started to see, well, when we communicate every day, like even this conversation, we're using some of the same principles. Asking questions, um, showing interest in each other, nodding our head, these nonverbal says, yes, I'm listening to you, right? All these things, and this is exactly what the bad guys do. So I started to say, well, what if we use it for good? Can we build better relationships with people? <laughs> so what do the bad guys, so let's start with the, bad, the dark side of things. What do okay. the bad guys do? How do we recognize them? Well, right now, um, you know, crypto is huge. Uh, crypto is big in the market and, and it, they, it's gotten way easier to invest in crypto than ever before. I remember when I started investing in crypto, you had to buy a wallet on some shady website. You had to get hooked up with a, a way to get money into an account so you could pay for it. Now with Coinbase and things like that, you could, you could buy crypto uh, currency really easy. And because of that, the scammers have realized that a lot of novices will start investing in crypto. And we're seeing a, I'm seeing personally with my clients, a lot of scams that involve people falling for giving a random person their passphrase because they believe their tech support. And then of course that person takes over their wallet, transfers all the, the crypto and it's lost. I mean, I have a, I have a client right now lost $197,000. Because so we're talking the seed phrase, right? The 12 words yeah. or 20 yep. words. I guess this is something that whatever happens in your life, you should never give to Ever. anybody, right? Never. I mean, there is no tech support person that's going to say, hey, I need that. Uh, because that literally gives control and ownership of your wallet. It's like saying, here's my ATM card. Here's my PIN please don't do anything bad with it, right? And that's in essence what you do when you give over that seed phrase is you are giving them full access to own your wallet. And as most of us who know anything about crypto know, it's not, it's really difficult to trace. It's hard to, to get it back. They can transfer it through multiple different wallets, change it from diff one currency to another, and you can get lost and never see your money again. Wow. So what are your quick tips for people new to crypto? Well, um, you know, I give the tips for the same, whether it's crypto or not. And here's the, the one that you just said is really the, the, the biggest one, is you have to critically think when you're getting uh, touched by someone who says they're tech support and say, like, why would somebody need this? And really, like, calm down from your emotional um, over, you know, overload because people get emotional. Maybe they're having a problem with their account, and this guy says, I can help you. I'm from tech support. So they want that help. Uh, so first is just that critical thought. And then second is just having a predetermined set of policies for yourself. 
right? So like if you think about it in a physical form, uh, most of us, when we go to an ATM machine, we might jiggle the slot a little bit to make sure it's safe, right? It's not a scam machine. Then we put our, our, our card in the slot. We cover our pin, uh, our, our keypad, so when we put our pin in, no one can see it. We take the card out. We put it in our wallet with our money, and we don't leave that receipt because it has information on it. All right, so that's a policy. You have these steps. So if you're going to invest in crypto, come up with a set of policies. Like this is something I'm never going to give to anyone, especially on the Internet. Uh, I'm only going to invest money that I can afford to lose because it's just like any other investment. If you put your life savings in it and you lose it, it's going to hurt a lot more. And just don't trust people without verification. Someone can tell you their tech support, but unless you've reached personally out to the company you're dealing with and you did the reaching out, not them reaching out to you, then you can't trust that that person really works for them. And now let's move to the bright sides. You have learned techniques that are universally available that leave people better off after they interact with us. Can you share them? Sure. So, uh, you know, it all started back, like I was saying, studying scammers and con artists and saying, how could this guy get somebody who is seemingly very intelligent to give over millions of dollars, willingly doing it with a smile on their face? And I started to analyze that. And then I said, well, I wonder if I can do this for the good. But there was a line. I said, I can't. Everything that these scammers do when they're done, their target feels really bad. They feel shame. They feel violated. They feel worse off. And I said, okay, so if I'm going to use these, how can I do it so the person feels good after they help me get what I want, right? And the answer came to me one night thinking about, well, what gives people control? And that is it. You, they have to have a choice to say no. So I said, can I use these tactics and give them a choice to say no? So I started to plan things out like if I use proper nonverbals and I use the right type of questions and I use influence principles instead of manipulation. But every time I take a step, if I give them a choice to say no and feel safe doing that, then when they help me, if they help me, they'll feel good about doing it because it was their choice, not me manipulating them. So I started to practice these things and I can't believe how it worked. We get free upgrades on flights, upgrades on car rentals, just generally just have nice people conversations with complete strangers. Uh, it's, it's really fascinating to see how well it works in developing good close relationships with people you never met before. <laughs> how did writing the book change you? Oh, that's a great question. You know, so, um, when I first had this idea for, for the book, I thought to myself, no, one, no one's going to want to read this. I mean, it's like a book from a guy who gets paid to break in the buildings, and now he's saying, hey, you can use these things to be a better person, right? But I was talking to a good friend of mine, uh, Joe Navarro. He's, um, he's a body language expert, and I was telling him this idea. And he said, this is a great idea. You need to write that book. And I said, you think like anyone's going to want to read it? And he said, let me introduce you to an agent, a book agent, a literary agent. So he introduced me to this guy, Steve Ross, and, and Steve's been doing this for decades. Like he knows so many things and so many people in the, in the writing industry. And I told him the idea and he said, we got to make this into a book. Okay, so that's just the beginning part of your question. Now, you know, how did I get there? But then as I'm writing it, I'm starting to really plan out how I can teach other people to do these things, people who may never even thought about that, who have no experience in social engineering or influence, who may not be aware of their own personality and, and communication flaws. And it really helped me to delve deep into myself, to analyze how I communicate, how I communicate with my family, my employees, fellow people just every day. And it really made, writing this book made me a better person. It, it, ch it changed me more so than teaching it in any other way because I was committing now to paper things that I was saying I'm going to live by. And it really connected in my brain and made, it just, it changed me. It, it was a, it was a really enlightening experience writing this book. Wow. And I'm thinking my journey in, in learning about myself, how I communicate. One is of course having children because they will tell yes. you what they see. And you will feel it straight away. They will oh, say, yeah. Daddy, this is bullshit. And they are right. <laughs> yeah. And the second thing was 
every day for the last four years, I've, I've been talking every day for with one stranger on this podcast. And so huh. I don't watch the videos, but sometimes, you know, I, you see it like, okay, there comes a video from you and you go, what? That's how I talk and <laughs> how I learn from, from, from yeah. week to week. And 600 episodes later, uh, I'm, I'm learning now the basics of communication. And I'm, and I'm wondering if somebody doesn't have a podcast every day, how do they learn to better yeah. communicate, to become a better listener? That's a great question. And what I tell people when they ask me that is to do what you do, but just not for a podcast. Every day, when you go out to your favorite coffee shop or you hit the grocery store to buy something for dinner, interact with one complete stranger with no purpose in mind, just to have a 60, 90 second conversation. Mm -hmm. Make a goal for yourself. I'm going to find out one stranger's full name today. So I'm walking through the grocery store and you're standing there looking at the pasta aisle. And I say, hey, you know what? what what's your favorite brand? You know, I'm, I'm here. My wife sent me to pick up some pasta. Like, what, what's your favorite brand? And now you tell me, like, hey, man, thanks. I'm going to try this out. Hey, it was cool meeting you. I'm Chris. You know, hey, I'm Simon. Bam, I just met a complete stranger, had a friendly conversation, got advice from you on something, and validated you because I bought the very thing that you gave me advice for. Right. Wow. And, and, and it's just something simple. And now I don't have a podcast, but I'm going out and interacting with a complete stranger every day and learning how I can communicate better. I was now thinking because I'm an extrovert, but not everybody is. So what if I'm an, an introvert and it doesn't, it does feel hard to, yeah. to start a conversation, to, to win friends, to start a friendship. What can I do? So my COO at my company, who's also one of the best social engineers I, I know, is a, is a deep introvert, really big introvert. And him and I have had this conversation a lot about how to break out of that. And his answer is, is that you have to, you, not, I can't do this for anyone. You have to be comfortable putting yourself out of your comfort zone. And then you have to make little self challenges. So if you're an introvert, you have to say, okay, look, I want to be better at communication. So first, I'm going to do something today that's truly uncomfortable. Now, I just gave you a challenge to go meet a stranger. Maybe that's too much for your first time. So maybe the first time you're not even getting someone's name. Maybe the first time is you're just going to walk up to a stranger and ask for advice on something to buy. That's it. That's it. And then you do that five, 10 times until that's no longer making your heart thump out of your chest. And then you say, now next time I do this, I'm going to ask that person's first name. And you do that 5, 10, 15 times until you're no longer nervous. And it may take you longer than an extrovert, but you can continue to grow. And now I see Ryan. This guy will come with me. We'll break in the buildings together. He's giving speeches on stage. He's a trainer in front of tens and tens of people teaching them all about this stuff. And he is a deep introvert. And he, he did it. But it took some time. But it's just getting that out of your comfort zone. You can pick one person for the strategy award. When everybody's zigging, this person is zagging. But from your perspective, they're doing the right thing. Who do you pick? Oh, man. You know, I, I'd have to, I, you know, and I, I think I, I, I may even, when I read that question, I may even change my answer. But I'm going to say J uh, Joe Navarro, my good friend Joe Navarro. He, uh, he thinks of things very differently than other people. And he also, he just doesn't seem to, get swayed by what other people think when he says, I want to go left. If everyone's saying, no, Joe, Joe, you got to go right. He's like, I'm going to go left. I'm going to go left and I'm going to try it. And he's willing to accept a failure if it fails. And he's willing to accept the praise if he, if it succeeds. But I, I just admire that about him so much. Cool. And where do you take your inspiration from? Are there specific books, podcasts that give you inspiration? Yeah. Um, so there's a few. So some of my favorite books, um, Amy Cuddy's Presence. It's just to me, not only her book, but her story, uh, just how she was told that she wouldn't succeed because of a car accident, that she could never achieve her dreams. And now she has, I think it's one of the top three most watched TED Talks on the planet. And her science has been validated over and over. She's, she's an amazing person. Um, Daniel Goldman's um, uh, Emotional Intelligence, that book is phenomenal because he, he coined the phrase amygdala hijacking and he helped us understand scientifically how we can fall for some of these things when our amygdala is hijacked. Um, of course, I would say Joe Navarro's books as he's one of my mentors and Dr. Paul Ekman, 
um, uh, I take inspiration from those two because they take a very deep subject and they write it in a way that lay people can understand. I don't have a degree in this stuff. I don't, I don't, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a researcher. But because of the way that they write, um, I'm able to, to understand it and then teach it to others. So, I mean, I can go on and on. I love reading. So I have so many books that I love. But I would say that those are the books that I really enjoy. I, I'm, I'm big into health right now. I've, I've gone on a big health kick over the last um, 12 months with COVID. Um, so I'm listening to the Huberman podcast, which is a, a he's a, a scientist and researcher that talks a lot about health. Really love that one. And um, one of my favorite ones that just popped up is a, a podcast by Mo Gadot, and uh, it's mm. Slow Mo. Um, he has a phenomenal story, and his book, which is uh, Solving for Happiness, uh, which I just started, so I can't say much about it, but I just started it. Uh, but I find him inspirational, his his story. I won't ruin it for anyone. If you just look him up, his story is inspirational, and he is just an amazing person. I just bought the book Solve for Happy because because it says an ex-Googler and it says Solve for Happy. Yeah. I'm in. I'm in. I need this book. Yeah. But I didn't yeah. read it also yet. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a, a genius. He's a literal genius. And he had a traumatic life experience that he could have folded into himself and become an, um, an introvert, and he didn't. He, uh, he utilized um, that catastrophe to create uh, this process to be happy. Mm -hmm. And he just wants to share it with the world and his attitude, his personality, everything about him, he's amazing. So I, um, yeah, I find a lot of inspiration from different things like that. It's funny because it's a lot of times not even people in my own industry. It's people that I look at their stories You know, like uh, I hate to keep referring to him because there are people going to think I'm too much of a fanboy. But Joe Navarro, he came to America as a young boy from Cuba and didn't understand English. And he went on to serve in the FBI for 20 something years, created, helped create the behavioral analysis program, went on to write 14 books on nonverbals. And now is one of the world's most renowned experts on nonverbal body language. That's cr like, you know, this is a guy who came from a foreign country and didn't even know the language. And now he went on to excel in everything. I look at people like that and I go, wow, like if they can do this, like I, I, I got to find inspiration in that. Yeah, absolutely. And you are my inspiration because you have a literary agent and you're crushing <laughs> it. How does one first find a literary agent and then how is it to work? What's the process? Yeah, so um, I, I've written four books before this one, and I didn't have an agent. So I, I was with a small tech publisher named Wiley, and um, that's a process that a lot of people who write go through, like where you kind of fill out this really long application, and you send in, if they like you, you get like nine months to write a book, and you have to whip it out and done. Uh, this was a much different process. So the way I met this agent was through Joe. So I got a referral, which was nice. Now, there's other ways to do that because literary agents like post online and advertise so you can call them. But a lot of literary agents, the way they work is they want to hear your idea and then they'll tell you if they think it's good or not. And you have to be able to deal with that because I went to three or four different agents before I was introduced to Steve and they all went, nah, I'm not interested. And I, I could have said, you know what? I, that's it. No one really wants us. It's garbage. It's not a good idea. And... And I kept going at it. And then when I told Joe, and he's like, no, you need to talk to Steve. Um, so when I met Steve, the thing that he helps with, and this is where it really gets uh, difficult, is you put a lot of work into preparing for the book before anyone even decides to buy it. Like the, 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 the manuscript. Like you're, I'm working with a ghostwriter. We're writing a proposal, which could be like 70 pages long. Um, you're, you know, you're, you're outlining the whole thing about the book, what you want, what, what you're going to do to help promote it. And then once you get started writing, it took us a year and a half. It was working through every process. And one of the things about this book that I truly appreciate is everything I said that involves science, I had to prove it through research. I had to show scientific research that was validated and that was current to say, this is why I can say this works. So I feel like when someone reads the book, they're not getting just, hey, here's my, I think this will work because I did it a few times. This is, here's a piece of science that says this. Then I went and tried it and it worked. Um, and then once the book comes out, it's promotion time. So it doesn't end. 
So this has been now like a two and a half year process, you know, in getting this book launched. It's quite a lot of work, more work than I had anticipated, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't not do it. I would do it again in a heartbeat. Cause, cause some, some guests have said, Simon, it's all this first week and even the pre-order period, that's the highest intensity yeah. and others say, no, 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 it's evolving and every day for years. Is it both? It's both. You see, so I'll give you like a, a sad story. My book came out January 5th. January 6th was the Capitol riots. We had, we had marketing and promotion planned and it got, there was no, you couldn't, you, you could have had the cure for cancer on January 6th <laughs> and nobody would have listened to you, right? So here I launched this book on the worst day in human history, right? I mean, it's like if the whole world is watching the TV because people are ripping apart the United States Capitol building. No one cares about a book about making people feel better, right? So the, the book got drowned out for almost a month and a half, which anybody who wrote a book will tell you that seems like a death warrant. You know, like you can't do anything. But, um, you know, we regrouped. I said, okay, look, when this news dies down, people are going to be angry. People are going to be upset. People are going to be emotional. And that might be a good time to say, hey, you can change that about yourself. You could still communicate wholly. Mm -hmm. You could still communicate with kindness and empathy. And here, I got a tool to help you. So we did that. Now, was it as awesome and exciting as if I got it right on June, January 5th? No, but, um, but then this is happening where slowly I'm getting on wonderful podcasts like yours and others to talk about the book, even though it's, it's, it's months now, you know, and that's okay because I think that the stuff I wrote, it's not about 2020, 2021, 2022. These are things just like the original book, Dale Carnegie's, you know, Win Friends, Influence People. That was written in the 1930s. That was a, that book was written in 1932 and we still reference it and love it today. So I feel like the, the information in this book is not something that's going to die out quick. We can use it as long as we have humans on earth communicating, we're going to be able to use this. So I feel it's both, you know, a good launch and then a good ramp up and you can, you can succeed. I love it. Where can people find you? Where do you hang out? So uh, online, uh, I'm probably mo most active on both LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, on Twitter, I'm Human Hacker, and on uh, LinkedIn, it's just Chris Hadnagy. Um, and and my companies that we have we have other social media like Facebook and Instagram and things like that. But me personally, I'm most active on on those two social media sites. You're a human hacker. What, was it easy to verify that? <laughs> yeah. So I got that. I mean, I think Twitter was brand new, and I'm like, hey, you know what? This is what I do for a living. I'm just going to get this one. It ended up being a great, a great. I've had it since boy, I think 2000 and. Eight, two 2007 I've had that so I've had that that name for a long time <laughs> it's a great name yeah thank you <laughs> and um who should be my next guest oh man I mean I talk a lot about Joe I think Joe Joe would be an awesome guest for you um I think he would really um bring a lot of great information for your people you know I have another guy Robin Dreek uh, he worked for the FBI for 20 something years as a director of the behavioral analysis program. And he wrote a book. Uh, he wrote a series of books recently on building trust and rapport. Uh, he, he focuses a lot on positive communications. He's a great, uh, I've had him on my podcast quite a few times. Uh, he's a great guest and he's a really positive guy. Um, I, I should introduce you to him. He's a, he, he'd be a wonderful guest for your show. Super cool. And your book, human hacking, who should I gift this to for Christmas? Is it more my kids because, hey, this is how you learn to defend yourself from the bad people? Or is it my friends? Hey, don't get hacked by crypto scammers. Who, who should I give this to? I think anybody that you think could use help in becoming self-aware and learning to communicate daily. I've, you, I've taught my children, both my kids, my son and my daughter, all of the skills in this book. Um, I've, my wife and I have these discussions all the time and I've also gifted that to my friends and my, my employees and my coworkers. Um, I think anybody that you feel can benefit from learning to communicate, uh, you know, and, and, and somebody that you think might help, might, they might help them become more self-aware because that's really the whole message of the book is becoming more self-aware about 
your flaws, not trying to figure out other people's. Thank you so much, Christopher, for being here. Christopher Hadnagi, everybody, human hacking, get the book, give it to your friends. It's a great Christmas present. Thank you, Christopher. Come back Thank soon. You, Simon. Avoid trying to do thousands of things that doesn't work. We have 274 templates for your business success. Reach your ambitious goals with one-on-one -on -one sprint coach. We double your revenue in 90.